All right, we are live. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for the Biohacker 101 class. Um, today we have a guest speaker, um, a person that I am honored to call uh, a colleague of mine, Dr. George Church from Harvard. So over the past few weeks, we have been talking about genetic engineering and uh, hopefully you all have received all your materials by now and have gotten started with the genetic engineering experiments for this month. Um, but if you haven't, there's still plenty of time. Anyway, today George is gonna talk to you about genetic engineering, the research he's doing in genetic engineering. And we're gonna open it up to questions that y'all can ask him about his research and the work he's done. So George, uh, I'm sure everybody on here knows who you are and is familiar with you. Somebody even said they read your book in the past couple of days. <laughs> so, wow. That's impressive. <laughs> so uh, if you want to get started and tell us a little bit about some of the cool stuff you're working on. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm mainly going to just make a few comments to provoke uh, questions. Uh, uh, in the in the questions uh, section, I could go into any depth you want, um, and uh, I'll, I'll I'll first give I'll work backwards from what are the cool applications to the technologies that enable those applications, and then if necessary, f further back into uh, you know history or, or basics. But I, it sounds like you've gotten most of the basics of, of molecular biology and cell biology, so. Certainly not going to start there. I'm going to start, you know, getting you interested in the why. Why should you be interested? Why should you learn certain things? And then work backwards from there. So um, let's start, you know, with our most recent greatest hits. Uh, so these are, uh, we're, we're making uh, pigs, which are humanized, that are, that are uh, made enough like human that they can transplant organs. And we do that by changing their sugars and their immune components and get rid of uh, their viruses. So that's project one. Uh, project number two is we, th we think we have a way that we can make any uh, organism resistant to all viruses simultaneously, even viruses we've never studied before, never seen before. It's quite a trick. I mean, usually you have to have a deep knowledge of your enemy before you can uh, pr protect yourself. And uh, and, that, and that's done by changing the genetic code. Now, changing the genetic code, um, the more you know about the genetic code, the more you realize that changing the genetic code is not an easy, doesn't sound like an easy thing to do. But it, it's, it's one, of the tech, one of the goals that we use to motivate us to develop better ways of writing genomes in addition uh, to reading them. Um, so that's project number two. And, it, and, and we've already applied it to... Uh, industrial microorganisms, um, and now we're tr starting to apply it to uh, pig and human, pig for the same reason as project one, uh, so that we can transplant organs, but humans also, um, they're used for manufacturing pharmaceuticals and they're super um, sensitive to, to viral contamination and also human uh, cells are used in transplants. Uh, um, so anyway, that's, the uh, first one is, transplantable organs, the second one from pigs, the second one is uh, virus resistance. The third one um, is is reading DNA. So uh, so most most of what you guys are up to is synthetic biology, but I have, uh, I can assure you that the, the ability to read is just as important as the ability to write. It's hard to, to write a novel if you can't read. It's hard to proofread that novel if you can't read. Um, and so, it, so, that, so that's been a key part. And what, what our lab does in general is we um, uh, work on every possible way of doing a new technology. And, and a lot of it is motivated by reducing the cost. Um, and for both reading and writing, so <clears throat> uh, DNA, we've brought down the cost about 10 million fold uh, in less than a decade, which is faster than the computer revolution, and it's probably going to keep going uh, 
for a variety of reasons. But anyway, the, the application of reading, this part is about applications, is um, in addition to helping synthetic biology, it's also helping you understand your genome and uh, essentially preventative medicine where we can prevent 7,000 different um, uh, inherited diseases that uh, afflict about 5% of the population and which are uh, avoidable, uh, so at very low cost, and by genetic counseling. And they're avoidable at, at very high cost, hypothetically, in the future by uh, uh, gene therapy, which is related to the gene genetic engineering that you're doing uh, as we speak. So that's, that's, a, that's a snapshot of the reading component. Um, there is a programming of, of, of human tissues. Uh, so we have transcription factors. These are regulatory proteins that tell um, our uh, fertilized egg, our, our zygote, uh, when, we're, when, we, when we were just one cell, all of us were one cell at one point. Uh, it tells us how, to, how to, to differentiate and make all the beautiful abundance of different tissues. We have now harnessed all those transcription factors. We've made them into, we've genetically engineered them into vectors um, so that we can use them either as a library, as a collection, or we can use them individually or various combinations to push a stem cell to, into almost any tissue we want. We don't, we don't know if there's a limitation yet. It doesn't seem, it seems like it's very easy to get to any tissue with about 98% yield in about four days. So no matter how long it takes to happen in nature, we can do it in four days. Are, um, you, are you finally gonna be able to grow people some wings? Um, well, so right, right now, we're, <laughs> why not? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. I've got a little tattoo on my back as to where to insert them once we're ready. Uh, <laughs> speaking of tattoo, I have, a, a, I have this thing on my hand here, just in case I forget uh, AC. <laughs> A base pairs with T and G C base pairs with G. Yeah, I was going to ask what that was all about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it's really hard to remember that, you know. So you know, you have, to, you have to tattoo it on your arm. I would recommend everybody does. No, actually, what this is is a uh, is a photographer uh, has a little thing where she, where she asks the people she's photographing to write something on their hand, and she takes a picture of them like this. Anyway, so. That will wash off later tonight. I'm gonna get the same <laughs> tattoo. <laughs> but if you want to tattoo it, I would I would recommend you tattoo the whole genetic code, not just the uh, four pages. <laughs> good idea. That's a really good idea. <laughs> um, if you use it enough, you will get to know it without the tattoo. Um, so, so anyway, we can make we can now make not just cell types like neurons and and glia and um, uh, endothelial cells and so forth, but we can make mixtures of these which start to have organ-like properties. They're sometimes called organoids, which is kind of a, a humble way of saying we're, we're not yet making something that is transplantable, which would be an organ. Um, these are little things that um, have the advantage of being little. You can pack a lot of them into a small space and you can do lots of experiments very cheaply, more cheaply than and more humanely than animal experiments. Um, but still, there are advantages uh, for both, um, and we're so we're making we're mainly focusing on making little little brain components, so miniature uh, versions of my brain. Since these cells are derived from my body, I'm 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 in a project called Personal Genome Project, which I'll leave for the next uh, item on our list. But the, we we uh, use uh, those those stem cells to make um, complex uh, organs. For testing drugs and for testing possible uh, therapies in general and uh, possible transplants. Oh, let's see. Um, we're work, we, we work on a variety of safety engineering, so with biocontainment, um, um, so that if, if you want to use a, an engineered organism in a factory or in the wild, someplace where it's mixed with others, it will be virus resistant, as I already mentioned, but it also it can't escape because it's uh, dependent on a particular organic chemical that you, it's only made, not made in nature. Uh, but George, didn't we learn from Jurassic Park with the leucine contingency? <laughs> yeah, so I was just about to bring up Jurassic Park, but I'm glad you did. Uh, the leucine contingent was, uh, was 
you know, I think that uh, Michael Crichton is 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 brilliant writer, and he he actually attended Harvard Medical School, so he knew biochemistry quite well. But I don't know what he was thinking when he came up with the lysine contingent, because the the, the premise for the, those of you who haven't read Jurassic Park was that the dinosaurs would starve if they escaped because they needed lysine in their diet in order to survive, and presumably that was going to be rare outside of the confines of Jurassic Park. When in fact it is not rare, and and Michael should have known this. Uh, lysine is present in every single food. I mean, it's not like it's occasionally there. It, every every plant and animal and microbe in the planet has full of lysine. Uh, so what we did instead is we didn't use lysine. In fact, the NIH has something almost as ridiculous, which is diaminopimelic acid, which is uh, present in many, many bacterials, which is present in almost every environment. But we use something that is only made by a uh, complicated organic chemistry. It's, it's relatively inexpensive, but it is totally unnatural. <coughs> and so we, we made it so that their escape rate is less than one in 10 to the 16th, um, 16 zeros. Um, but we could make it, I think, as low as we want. That's pretty, pretty low. Um, so, so some of the, some other safety uh, engineering projects. Most most fields of engineering have safety components. You know, like so the bridges don't fall down, so that your computers don't get hacked. Uh, and almost every one of them has some disaster where the safety engineering failed. Uh, um, so we have. You know, for some things, failure is not an option. That was kind of the motto for NASA in the Apollo project: is failure is not an option. Uh, I would, I think, uh, that might be true for certain types of uh, biotechnology as well. But, but generally speaking, there are there are ways that you can uh, uh, do small amounts of failure on your pathway to success. Uh, like, you know, with a, developing a new drug, your uh, uh, you're going to have to uh, something. There's a reason that about uh, the success rate is on the order of four percent until recently. Now it's getting up around twenty percent. Uh, I just uh, learned this straight from AstraZeneca today. Um, but still, that those low rates are because many of them fail either due to toxicity or efficacy failure to to, to do what they're supposed to do. Um, I think we're getting to the point where maybe I should open it up for questions. Uh, I I can go uh, in in even more depth on it, whatever you whatever you any topic you'd like. All right. So the first few questions we have, people are really interested in the organoids and those the tissues that you're creating from stem cells. So a couple questions like, uh, why like these 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 organoids, do you think we could create things like beta cells for diabetics? And like, is there something preventing us from creating those? Uh, is the FDA preventing those things from going to the clinic? And like, what, what insight do you have into that process? So yes, beta cells are one of the um, um, early, hopefully early applications of this. Um, they have a, a huge advantage over injecting yourself with insulin. They have a, 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 a feedback loop that senses glucose and a variety of other things and integrates all kinds of physiological parameters and gives the right dose if it's done right. I don't think, uh, no, the FDA is not blocking this. It really is, uh, um, if you're not careful, you get rejection. So some, some forms of uh, diabetes are due to immune um, reaction with the beta cells and so obviously that's going to be you're going to have to overcome that in those cases uh in other cases they're just not they just really are not uh producing insulin you know that or they're not pro properly differentiated in in efficiently uh but i think we're probably pretty close this is not one of this is not one of our projects this is something that the field is is attempting to do what we're just doing is providing new technologies uh, that might allow it to be more efficient or um, productive. Um, and in fact, my observation with the FDA in general is it has kind of a reputation for being stodgy and in the in the and in, and in the way of progress. And and that's not my observation. I've I've been there three times this year. That what one thing that you may all may not know is 
almost everybody at the FDA is a re is a bench scientist. I mean, they actually still have active research programs. They're not uh, just bureaucrats, and uh, and they are they will embrace uh, radical new technologies as long as they're safe and effective. So, and, and to some extent, it's more likely a new technology is going to be safe and effective uh, than an old one. Uh, and so, so that so they they do approve some pretty uh, odd new technologies. Like the, there's one that they approved in a fairly short period of time, which was a pill that when you eat it. Um, it and it hits your stomach acid. It, it triggers a, a, a tiny electronic device that uh, emits a radio signal that, that can tell a device outside your body that you're compliant, that you're actually not just that you're eating the pill on time. Um, so anyway, I like the FDA. I, I think they protect us, uh, but but you know um, we need to. Uh, continue to innovate and make things that brand new things that are safe and effective i have a, or this is a question from me um do you think the fda is too risk averse or do you think we could you know maybe try stuff that's a little more riskier how do you feel about stuff like that i think they i think they're just about right uh i you know i think that uh for example uh we the FDA and the European version, the EMA, um, were both faced with the same problem of testing a new drug for morning sickness um, back when, when I was a child. Uh, pregnant women <clears throat> would take thalidomide, uh, and, and that was approved in Europe and not in America. And as a consequence, 15,000 uh, European babies were born with severely deformed and shortened uh, arms and legs. And that uh, was, uh, uh, you know, considered a tragedy uh, in, in, drug, uh, in drug testing. So that was a close call. And there are many things which, uh, which the FDA has approved, which then in, in what's called phase four trials, which is after you've done phase one, two, and three, you're approved for selling it to the public. And then you're kind of doing another trial, although everybody's paying you for it. Um, it's called phase four and, and things like Viox and, uh, um, were, were essentially reevaluated, um, in the, in the broader population. So, you know, those are anecdotes. Uh, it's hard to say, uh, exactly what's been missed. Uh, certainly there was a, during the AIDS, uh, uh, beginning of AIDS activism, there was a lot of effort to, uh, to get drugs out faster and they, you know, uh, and I think that was very effective activism and, and it, and it also resulted in a raising of consciousness about, uh, about gays, uh, in general, that before that there were, there was considerably less openness and acceptance. Um, but, but there were some, uh, but sometimes when you try to rush things, uh, uh one of the things that happened is people uh, in clinical trials will sometimes take all, they'll, they'll be divided up randomly into the control group and the placebo group, and they won't like that because they don't want to be in the placebo group. So what they'll do is they'll have little parties where everybody gets together and they put all their pills in the middle of the table and they mix them up and, they, or they'll, they'll take uh, some of each know, knowing that, uh, that they'll, they may be getting half the dose of the, but at least nobody's taking pure placebo. And of course, this completely screws up the clinical trial and doesn't speed things up, it slows things down. And it might even not work if they're taking half the dose. So uh, that's not uh, ideal. Um, but anyway, I mean, I think the point is there's plenty of room for innovation. There's plenty of room for uh, self-experimentation that is slightly outside of the system. What they they aren't really trying to stop people from innovating. Like uh, you, you've probably heard in this course already about Barry Marshall, who tested Helicobacter. Did you tell them about that yet, Josiah? But Barry yeah. Marshall, uh, he 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 ate the Helicobacter to prove his theory, which was not popular at the time, that it caused ulcers. And he took they took antibiotics, which got rid of them, and he did it again. Um, that's probably okay from the FDA standpoint. Uh, what, 
what they what they're trying to avoid is you manufacturing thousands of bottles and putting on the label this cures all diseases uh you know you know take once a day and uh send us lots of money that they that's what they don't want they don't want unsubstantiated claims is the main thing they're trying to to fight off especially unsubstantiated so, claims with uh, unsafe uh chemicals yeah so uh you know somebody asked the question you know you're a very successful academic right um so like if you had to do it all over again do you think you'd go back into academia or you know do a company or something else and what do you think like do you think the current academic system like there are things that could be improved on or do you think the model you know publisher parish or whatever that's going on now is 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 successful and like is a uh, you know a good way to do things or yeah i mean it it probably can be improved on uh i mean I, it's an experiment uh i think it's kind of like democracy it's a terrible system it's just that it's there's no better system uh that we that i know of um it has so if if i were to do it over yes i would go in academia of course i'm not really in academia i'm sort of at the at the junction between academia and and industry so i get kind of to choose on a daily basis how what my ratio is um uh but i it has certain advantages so for me and i think many people Tenure is nice uh, in that you can do outrageous things and not lose your job within some, you know, don't commit felonies that you can lose tenure if you are in prison. Uh, but uh, tenure is one thing that's good. I think another thing is uh, uh, that you can, it's hard to do in industry as I have uh, very talented graduate students and even undergraduates who are willing to try things that are it's kind of hard to do in industry. You can you can take a, you can try you know really wacky experiments where there's there's no way you're going to make any money off of this, or at least that's what you think. Uh, and then sometimes you're, you're pleasantly surprised. But the point is you're willing you're you're much more willing to take that risk when you're young, uh, or when you're a, a professor with tenure. Um, uh, you know. The yeah. The publisher parish thing, I think that's a little exaggerated. I mean, I, I, I didn't have a very good publication record when I got tenure. Uh, now I do. It's pretty good. Uh, but at the time, you know, I had just taken on a lot of really difficult projects uh, that hadn't paid off yet. So, you know, it's, it's not perfect. Uh, I'd, I'd love to, to try some other experiments. Well, there are other experiments. I mean, like, for example, online courses, that's that's an alternative to the teaching part of academia. The research part uh, is harder to come by. I mean, we had things like Bell Labs, um, their DIY bio labs. That's a that's a good alternative. Uh, that that isn't. Uh, but to but to get but to make it so these things uh, pay for themselves without being profitable. That's that's academia is fairly good at that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> That's a big problem, I think, with a lot of independent science or like biohacking or DIY bio is getting the money to pay for stuff and yeah. figuring out a model in which to provide people with resources so they can do stuff like this. Um, so I know there's a large contingent of people listening who are interested in longevity and regeneration and um you know, reversing aging and things like that. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people are skeptical of these things. And I know you're a supporter of these things and have companies that work towards these things. What do you think are the two or three biggest things that you're working on that will contribute to reversing aging or uh, longevity in humans? Well, it's it's uh, perfectly appropriate to be skeptical. I mean, that, that's <laughs> one of the, one of the, uh, many traits that, that can that help help you become a scientist. Uh, certainly I'm among those. And in particular, aging uh, research field or aging um, medicines field um, has had uh, a lot of wishful thinking and occasionally a charlatan or two. 
Um, so you should be especially cautious. Uh, the wasteful thinking is that it's something that you eat or drink, like the fountain of youth, or something you avoid eating, like caloric restriction. There is definitely some some research that supports caloric restriction in animals, but there's in rodents, but there's nothing as far uh, the the work on humans and primates is um, much less compelling than the rodent experiments, um, and it's kind of an unpleasant way to <laughs> live forever. Uh, uh, or even not sorry it's not forever it's just a small uh, a small extension um, what we're what we're doing what we're pursuing uh, is mainly uh, looking at the fundamental biology which has been well studied in worms and flies and and mice and just turning each of those observations into a gene therapy it's a very easy thing to do um, <clears throat> as I'm sure you're learning already in this class uh, it's, it's actually much easier to develop a gene therapy, a new one, than it is to develop a new small molecule chemical like, you know, aspirin or Vioxx or uh, thalidomide. Uh, uh, <laughs> so, the, with the gene therapies, uh, you can you can try them out in in mice with a variety of different um, either you know aging disease uh, models. Um, or aging itself. The advantage of aging reversal over longevity sounds like a subtle nuance. The, the critical differ difference from an experimental and regulatory standpoint is it's faster. It's faster to do, in principle, faster to do aging reversal than to do longevity. Longevity, if you want to extend life by you know, even 30%, then the FDA is gonna say, good, come back with a 30 year uh, clinical trial, which is extraordinarily expensive and, and long, but if you but if you but th there's a, the possibility that you can get aging reversal where you can get changes in strength or cognition or um, uh, res resilience to damage that could that could be apparent almost immediately. So that's a big difference, and that's why we focus on it. And we've now taken we have a paper submitted for publication where we've taken started with about 40 some uh, uh, genes in, in, packaged in adeno-associated virus vectors. Uh, so just a virus capsid, no virus, just the protein capsid with each of these genes one at a time and then in various combinations. And eventually we whittled it down to a combination of two genes that are, uh, um, that when combined will deal with five diseases that we chose. So we fo chose five diseases that uh, are associated with aging that, that only happen as you age. And these are obesity, uh, these are high fat diet induced obesity where you, where you get the animals to be twice their normal weight. And uh, um, um, uh, uh, damaged heart model, uh, uh, type two diabetes, a um, osteoarthritis and, um, and and kidney uh, disease, and each of these things and and these these two uh, genes are sufficient to hit all five um, diseases of aging simultaneously. And so we're not trying to get approval to put on the bottle this cures aging. We're trying to put on the bottle that if you have any of these five diseases, um, then you can take this pill, and it might not only cure that particular or reverse that disease, it could uh, protect you from the other ones as well. But that's, um, in principle, we could get approval for any of the five. It doesn't have to be all five. But if we're really right that we're on the, we're on the right track for aging, which is a multi-component, there are like nine major pathways in, in uh, aging, including mitochondrial dysfunction, uh, telomere shortening, uh, or clearing of senescent cells and so forth. If you can reverse each of those processes uh, all at once, then you, you've probably got something that will deal with every disease of aging simultaneously. That's, that's uh, going. Yeah. So those experiments you've been doing in dogs, pigs? So those are done initially in mice and then in those that pass the mouse test go into dogs. Dogs are important not only as a uh, segue to humans, but also there are there there's a veterinary product in there because people uh, 
you know, want their dogs to be healthy at the end of life uh, and want to get a few more years of, of healthy life. Um, I mean, some pet owners pay as much as $100,000 to clone their dog. That's not really what they want because a clone dog is not that different from buying a puppy of the same breed. Uh, it's really not the same animal. It, it's, it doesn't have any memories. It doesn't have, doesn't even necessarily have the same morphology and coloration. I mean, it have the breed level coloration, but it won't have the individual level of morphology. I don't know. Barbara Streisand would say something different. <laughs> what would she say? She would say the same dog is cloned throughout, and that's why she has like 10 of the same clone dogs. Okay. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to pop anybody's bubble that spent a lot of money on their clone dogs, but uh, it's not for everybody. Let's put it that way. It is expensive and in principle, gene therapy doesn't have to be. So uh, I, kn uh, I know, and, and I'm sure other people know that you have defer, um, you know, your opinion has been a little different than the mainstream scientists on, you know, the, the recent embryo editing and, you know, uh, self-experimentation and things like that. Um, why do you think that is, and what do you think uh, is going to happen in the future regarding these things, you know, uh, genetically modified human embryos, human gene therapy, uh, things like that? Well, I'm, I'm not that far away from centric. I don't want to uh, <laughs> take credit for something that, that requires considerably more boldness than I have, but, but yes, I am... If there's an outlier in the mainstream, it will probably be me. Uh, but for example, on uh, you know on gene therapy, I've helped create uh, a few companies. One of them, one of the most mainstream gene editing companies you can imagine, which is Editas, um, uh, which had which was founded by almost all the major founders of the field of CRISPR. It was co-founded with Jennifer Doudna and Feng Zhang and David Liu and uh, Keith Young. So that's very conventional gene therapy in adults. Uh, they just got FDA approval for the first in vivo um, gene therapy, meaning ex vivo is where you take the cells out, you treat them in the lab, but maybe do some QC and put them back. In, in vivo means, in this case, uh, LCA10, a, a retinal disease where you do an injection uh, into the eye. And there's already a, an approved gene therapy, not an editing, but a, a, a conventional addition gene therapy. It's approved for uh, similar intra uh, uh, in, uh, retinal diseases. Um, so that's, I'm, I'm just establishing my credentials as mainstream and ordinary. Uh, uh, on the on the uh, on the embryo, it is it is true that I've been uh, outspoken against moratoria. Uh, uh, you know, uh, where people say we need a moratorium uh, to prevent people from uh, in engineering embryos, and that's on it. But when you take that apart, you realize I'm actually more ordinary. It's just I just happen to be an outlier. Uh, so I'm basically saying the moratoria uh, we already have. Uh, laws against it. So a, a voluntary, non-binding, no penalty moratorium is not going to be as impactful as a law with actual penalties. In uh, fact, there, there are uh, newspaper articles claiming that, that someone who just broke that law is in J.K. He in China might be facing the death penalty. So that one would think that the death penalty would be more uh, off-putting than uh, admonishment from uh, Paul Berg and his colleagues on uh, <laughs> in a Nature paper, but uh, anyway, so that's one thing. It's it's likely to be ineffective. It's redundant of things that you know we've uh, that that already exist, laws that exist. Furthermore, moratoria very often uh, backfire. That is to say, by trying to suppress something, you just get everybody excited about it. So this hap this happened in my life twice, at least. Uh, one was. Uh, recombinant DNA moratorium, which was the, like kind of the original moratorium in biotech, uh, that got so much attention that suddenly a bunch of biotech companies started, I think, almost as a direct result of that, including Genentech and Biogen, where I was one of the first Biogen employees. 
and Amgen and so forth. And my own research, you know, they had to build these incredible facilities, these state-of-the-art facilities uh, to meet the safety requirements. And so I would work in these facilities, whether or not I had recombinant DNA to do because it was just amazing. And so, and, and then, the, then the embryonic stem cell for eight years during the Bush administration, there was a ban on federal funding for embryonic stem cells. And the result was that Massachusetts and California just cranked up their own local uh, uh, encouragement of those to the tune of $3 billion uh, that wouldn't have happened if there weren't a federal ban. So in both cases, the thing just completely, the moratoria just completely backfired and resulted in, uh, you know, billions of dollars of, of new capital that they didn't have. So, so in many levels, the uh, uh, moratorium on embryo uh, editing is misguided. What we have in place with the FDA and the equivalents in in other countries is uh, forbidding doing any new drugs that haven't gone through pro approval process. But the point, the, but the final evidence that it's ineffective is with all those laws, there still have people breaking the laws. And what we need is surveillance, uh, just like you have surveillance on the roads so that people don't break the laws that they got a driver's license for. Yeah. Um, somebody asked, do you think we need regulation on gene drives? Um, do you think gene drives are all, you know, every, all the, uh, you know, are all the hype that's behind them? They can accomplish what people say they can, or do you think it's something that will be a technology that helps us a little bit, maybe not be used or? Well, it's a little hard to predict. I mean, I, uh, <laughs> I'm reluctant to call anything hype uh, uh, because hype is a kind of dismissive word that, that, that kind of is intended to discourage people from figuring out what's true and what's false. Uh, I, I think that, uh, uh, you know, a little enthusiasm or, or, or sometimes people will be talking about a danger in the future uh, and it'll sound like they're hyping the currents. And sometimes they are. Uh, they're hype. They're making the current sound more interesting because it's dangerous in the future. Um, <clears throat> but gene drives, I think, uh, need to be taken seriously, both from a promise and a threat. It's much, to me, it's a much bigger problem than germline editing. Germline editing is uh, expensive, takes a long time to debug. There are lots of good alternatives. Um, it is possible, I'm not saying it's guaranteed or likely, but it is quite possible that that banning germline is kind of like banning jetpacks. Uh, it, it isn't going to happen anyway for a whole variety of reasons. So wh why are we wasting so many brilliant uh, people's time uh, discussing it? But gene drives is another matter because the stakes are very high on both sides. Uh, the the uh, malaria, but but it, but it won't solve everything. That's that's that. Whoever asked this question is correct. Completely correct there. It, it might be addressing malaria and Lyme disease as diseases, and it might address some in, in invasive species problems, but almost everything else is not going to touch. It specifically is limited to rapidly reproducing sexual s vectors or species, so things like um, mosquitoes in the case of malaria, white-footed mice in the case of Lyme disease, uh, rats, in the case of invasive species, that are eating the precious uh, endangered bird eggs um, in, on uh, 700 islands worldwide. So, um, so that's all on the positive side. On the negative side, uh, it is possible that you, um, if you take out a species uh, with a gene drive, either make it extinct or somehow change its properties, you could have a chain reaction in the ecosystem. Got a question, ready? Take off. Got some questions. <laughs> Sorry, George. No, it's okay. Uh, so, uh, so if you have a, if you have a, a, you know, one of these uh, unintended consequences in the ecosystem, then uh, it could. Uh, it's it's hard to convince yourself you have enough information in advance to do that. Uh, but I think it's safe to say, in the case of malaria, probably the most promising of the application of gene drive, there are a uh, very small number of mosquitoes that carry malaria out of 
3,500 species of mosquito. There's about six that carry malaria in different in different subcontinents, uh, <clears throat> and uh, and there's no known organism that's completely dependent on any of those uh, mosquito species. Um, but it certainly merits further study. And also there are ways that you can take out the malaria, make the malaria extinct without making the mosquito extinct. So there's, there's a lot of options, but the stakes are, you know, are such that you need to be very careful before you release it. And, and, and probably the most confounding thing is that with, uh, with therapies, you're affecting that one person you injected for the, to, for, for most of them. Um, and that's it. The, the, if that person has a bad outcome, it stays in that person. But with, uh, with anything that replicates, especially something in the wild, it can spread into, uh, you might do that. You might conduct the study in a domed city on an Island, but it gets outside of the dome. It gets outside the Island. And so you need to uh, have as many biological and physical containment tested as possible before you embark on this. All right, thanks for that. I'm gonna take off and Esther's gonna take over. She's gonna start asking uh, some, some more questions. We got 15 more minutes. So give George all the questions you got. 15 more minutes to ask your questions. All right, George. Um, so I've, I've done quite a bit of, uh, wait, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, yeah. Okay, yep. cool. Um, yeah, so, you know, you finally made science really sexy in 2010, which is pretty cool. And uh, you made headlines with the woolly mammoth, which blew everyone's mind. Everyone's like, wow, how could you resurrect such a ginormous, like such a pivotal an like animal in the moment of time. So. You know, I was I was wondering, same with our students, um, what do you think about uh, just like re recreating, resurrecting um, extinct animals or creating new ones? Um, and like, what what are kind of the time frames do you think that we'll see brand new species or resurrected animals? Uh, yeah, well, I'm glad you brought up the new ones because in a way, we're not really resurrecting species so much as we're saving species from extinction by bringing in DNA from extinct species. We, and we're also creating uh, new species uh, in the sense that we can create new properties that were in neither, neither the ancient species nor the modern one. So we're making hybrids essentially, and the hybrids are acro across vast periods of time. So normally there are many barriers between species that can be geographical isolation, there can be uh, you know, molecular or physical incompatibility. Um, usually the species definition, especially in animals, is that they, they can't breed and make fertile offspring. Mm -hmm. But there's so many exceptions to that. I mean, you know, just look at, uh, you, know, uh, you know, Neanderthal and humans clearly interbred. I'm 3% Neanderthal. Um, oh really? I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, and 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 you know, there's some people that that are seven percent Denosovan, which is even further uh, distant ancestor, and uh, and the and the mammoths and the elephants clearly were uh, doing every possible combination in their hybridization. So what we're proposing is to make a hybrid where we take the best of both, and we're we can have more diversity than ever before. One of the things, one of the concerns is that maybe they won't be diverse enough, but we have all the diversity of current Asian elephant species, potentially African elephant species, which are very distant, but they do interbreed. Um, woolly mammoths from anywhere from 4,000 years ago back, you know, to 100,000 years ago, because that's, you can get DNA from that far back. Um, and geographically spread out, not just over the 19 million square kilometers of Arctic, but a lot of other places uh, that are no longer Arctic. So, so we have this great s sources of diversity, but we're not limited to that diversity. And that's not that's already not limiting, but but beyond that. So, for example, a lot of the reason that the Asian elephants are going extinct is a is a herpes virus uh, called EEHV, elephant endothelial herpes virus, and it's killing off uh, uh, many if um, uh, at least 25%, I've heard higher estimates of the 
of the baby elephants on weaning. So while they're drinking the mother's milk, they're getting exposed to the virus because they're in close contact with the mother who has the virus. Um, it's like humans are estimated to have, 90% of humans are estimated to have some kind of herpes virus. But they're also getting the mother's antibodies through the milk, and so they're immune to the virus until they start eating regular food and they no longer get any antibodies. They have to make their own antibodies, and they're, they're not, they don't do that. So anyway, so we, we are uh, synthesizing, re we're, we're uh, making uh, versions of the virus that we can use for making either vaccines or CRISPR or other um, protective uh, things that we can put into the germline of the elephants or the elamoths, uh, hybrids of elephant and mammoths. Um, we can also make them uh, more tolerant of certain foods. So if they knock down a tree, we want to reward them by making the tree edible, uh, you know, even if it's got some, you know, some plant bitterness or toxins. Um, you know, uh, they're, uh, the tusks, uh, are a, an attractant for, for poachers. Mm -hmm. We can conceivably make the tusks either shorter or something that could be controlled in some simple way so that wherever they're at risk for poachers, they have sh no tusks. Wherever they're not at risk, they have big tusks. Um, anyway, there's a lot of possibilities. Some of these have already been, uh, tested in the wild where, uh, a lot of Asian elephants don't, don't have tusks, uh, especially the females. So, um, so anyway, yeah, we're making hy hybrid species that, that uh, are well adapted to the modern world. Um, some people say, oh, there's global warming, so, so they have no, no home in the Arctic. Well, uh, news flash, 19 million square kilometers gets so cold in the winter, you'll, you know, even with your parka, you'll freeze. Uh, it's minus 40, you know, it's minus 40 for a long, long time. And so regular elephants like the snow, uh, but only for a few, you know, a few hours, just like, you know, humans. Uh, just, just like me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. Um, you know, a couple, couple wrapping up questions. Um, what do you think is interesting to pursue in synthetic biology, genetic engineering in the next 10 years? So let me, let me kind of rephrase it this way. Um, let's say we find the cure to like longevity and make you live, you know, a thousand more years. What in a thousand, let's say like a hundred years, what would you experience? Like if you were to walk down like a really futuristic district um, at like around like MIT, what would you kind of see or see advancements in or what would the future look like in a hundred years? So a hundred years is a, is a very long time when I mean, we've seen a, a drop in price of 10 million fold for reading and writing DNA in 10 years. So that's 10 rounds of that level of seven zeros. Uh, but I think, I think one thing is if we are at all successful at, uh, eliminating diseases of poverty with combinations of gene drives and vaccines and, and uh, golden rice and so forth, um, then those, all those people are freed up to focus more of their energy on, uh, um, you know, food, education, entrepreneurship, microfinancing, you know, and they'd start bootstrapping up. Um, so we could eliminate poverty, we could eliminate diseases, of the non-poverty nations, which are disease of aging. Uh, now we have, uh, now we buy ourselves decades of healthier life for everybody. And so all these people that now have uh, more time, more uh, financial resources, and they're, and they're younger than they were, uh, suddenly we have wealth. And that wealth could be used for the next big risk, bio, you know, risk to humanity after poverty and aging which is uh, getting hit by an asteroid. And so then what you'll see in your, your, your 100 years from now in the MIT, Harvard districts, hopefully will be a big enthusiasm for uh, making our bodies and, uh, uh, and, and the, our physics uh, suitable for um, nearby um, 
heavenly bodies like Moon and Mars, and even further ones like the the moons of Jupiter and Saturn, which have more water on them than Earth has, um, liquid water, more liquid water than Earth. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunities in our solar system and beyond, and ho and hopefully a lot of the industry in the in the Boston area will be uh, and other parts of the world will be uh, focused on that grand challenge. Yeah, that'd be cool. That'd be cool to see. Um, all right. The, the last question I'm going to ask is, so the Odin's Biohacker 101 class is pretty much breeding a new generation of genetic engineering and biohackers. Um, do you have any words to say to few future biohackers that will take this course and beyond? Yeah, I think I, I think this is a great movement. I, I uh, was uh, I worked with Jason Bobe, who established one of the first ones in uh, in Boston, uh, and uh, and also with uh, some of the founders of GenSpace. And I was at uh, BioCurious in San Francisco when, the day that it opened. Uh, I'm very much, very supportive of it, uh, and I think you know the you know we can all dream and. Uh, why not uh, that, that, that the next Stephen Jobs and Steve Wozniak are among you all out there? Um, that biology, if anything, is it's just as easy to get started as it is, uh, you know, building complex electronic circuits that that uh, that, that, that constituted the Apple One and the Apple Two. Um, so I, you know, I say follow your dreams, do it safely and uh, and transparently. Uh, and uh, be part of a community where you reinforce all your best aspects. Uh, yeah. Go for it. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> Wise words. <laughs> okay, um, awesome. That's kind of all the time we have left. Um, anything else you want to cover before we sign off here, George? No, it's just best wishes to everybody out there. All right. Yeah. Thanks so much for having us on. Um, yeah. yeah, and we'll chat really soon. Thanks, okay. you guys, for making Take it. Care. Yeah. Take care. Yeah, bye. bye.